thought I told you to never call this phone number again. <laughs> Dan Schaefer, the uh, the fourth member of the Schaefer family to join the Speech Guys family. It's an honor. Yeah, good crisp audio, too. You must be standing oh, right good. next to your modem just to make sure. <laughs> your voice sounds like That's six right. times more masculine than, than Mike's. <laughs> you know, it's funny you mentioned that because I was just refreshing myself on the Abolition of Man podcast. And mm. the, the chest was a man. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's impressive. Mike must yeah. have lost all the chest genes. Yeah, Dan, too. Uh, Dan has listened to at least that one episode. I know we were uh, accompanying to him while he's doing some drywall work in his basement. Um, Painting in the bathroom, in the master bathroom, but close enough. Right. So, Dan, we have you on here tonight uh, to introduce the episode concerning George W. Bush's speech. Can I, can I cut you off a little bit? <laughs> Dan, can you tell me, like, one memory of Mike from your childhood? Oh, man. Uh, I mean, there was... Wow, you caught me off guard. Uh, I mean, I used him to kind of waste time at the house whenever I was supposed to be helping my dad, maybe. <laughs> I mean, he was six years to my younger, and I remember my dad, our dad, was, uh, was hauling say 300 pound um beams uh to build this barn that that dad was building for our 4-h project instead of helping him since i had able body um lug around these these posts or these beams or whatever else dad needed me to do i remember we had a pile of dirt at the house from uh, excavating out the the foundation of this barn and i think me and michael had a uh, mud ramp going down into a big mud pit. Um, and we were wallowing in the mud while we were watching <laughs> that. Uh, sweat, sweat tirelessly building a, a barn. So, uh, yeah. good memories. Kind of along a similar vein. I know we did through go through a brief phase. Maybe it was only two or three times where we set booby traps for each other. Um, oh, yeah. I would, yep. we would we would stand on the porch while the other one goes set a booby trap somewhere in the yard. Obviously, it couldn't mm -hmm. be too involved, but the one that sticks out to me, Dan created a fake booby trap that was more <laughs> obvious to think that I had found the trap, and then I fell through the other one. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were easy. You were easy prey. <laughs> <laughs> if right, you were right. A rabbit, You'd be a drowned rabbit. <laughs> As everyone can see, Dan is the funnier man in the family. People usually don't believe, though, when I tell them that Dan is funnier than me. But it's true, as you can see here. Um, the speech Dan's introducing tonight, the George uh, W. Bush speech 2011. We're calling it not 2011, 2001. We're calling it the disbelief, sadness, and unyielding anger speech. If you can remember that name, Dan. That's great. Um Disbelief, sadness, and unyielding <laughs> anger, the three qualities to any 21st century man. Got it. <laughs> Before we introduce the speech, though, what are maybe some of your memories from that day? You were a freshman in college at SIU Edwardsville. I was in seventh grade. Our older sister, Lauren, was in her senior year of college at U of I. But what say you from that day? I remember... Waking up to, you know, for my morning routine, taking a shower, turning on the TV, and that's when I saw the the plane, or the, I guess the plane had just crashed into the first tower. No, what was going on? They weren't sure if it was a commercial airline gone astray type thing. They had really no clue. And, I mean, there was talk of terrorism, I guess, but... I remember going in, taking this, my my shower, and then there was there was a second plane that crashed. As the day progressed, I remember, you know classes were were canceled for that day. I do remember specifically watching that speech later in the day. I guess it was the evening time, uh, mm -hmm. whenever I was at work. Nobody was. I do remember nobody was there. It was pretty much empty. But I guess the TV was on, and I remember watching that speech and. 
de- you know, definitely feeling moved by it in some way, you know, patriotically. And- Did you have any thoughts, considerations of joining the military based upon that day? Of course, there was a fleeting thought, but, you know, never a serious thought. I did remember um, wanting to go give blood, but with a lot of things in my life, um, I've wanted to go do things, and then I just kind of dismiss it (laughs) and not do it. Yeah, didn't give blood that day, but that was the one patriotic thing I I intended to do. Mm -hmm. So if that counts for anything. (laughs) (laughs) Have you you given blood since? Uh, Yeah, one time. Uh Uh-huh. Yep, one is done. <laughs> okay, so also on that day, I did want to point out you did you said did sort of coalesce your memories, your thoughts on day into a letter. What what can you share about that letter that you wrote that day? Oh, thanks for the segue, Michael. So I did, yeah, I wrote a letter, um, and I have it with me. It's dated September eleventh, two thousand one. Yeah, I kind of read through it before this call. Um, so I, I do feel like it's, it's it's significant. So I'll read it here. Today is a terrible day in the history of our country. Today I woke up at 8.28, turned on the TV, and found a jet had crashed into the World Trade Building. So I took morning shower and found the Pentagon had also crashed into by a terrorist boarded jet. In all, four airliners were hijacked and crashed. The two into the towers, the other into the Pentagon, and the last in Pennsylvania, <laughs> the, the Arabs <laughs> are to blame for, for this. <laughs> As of right now, I apologize. A uh, name, man named Van, I said Van Wadham in here. He's been a problem for a while. Um, I said, I, I'm writing this because I believe this day will be remembered always. It will be in the history books forever. I watched how the largest towers, the largest city in America, fall to rubble, ash and gulf the floor of the city. Gas lines are long in St. Louis here. People are hearing of gas prices soaring to $5 a gallon. Why would a people do this kind of act to another people? The TVs and radios have been carrying the story all day. Act has taken over our thoughts and actions all day. My classes were both canceled, as were most schools. As I sit here at work at 6 p.m., there's not much new going on. Uh, I just said I feel great pride for our nation and have not felt for a while, not really for our government, but for our people, the people who make up our great free nation in a time of tragedy we pull together. I hope I have kids to read to this, read this to someday. And then I said, uh, that's it. God bless America. And then I, I signed it, Dan Schaefer. That's me. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And I believe you have shared it with two of your three kids, Addie and Colton, once or twice. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Brought tears to my eyes whenever I first read the ending, hoping to have kids to read it to someday. That was great. Thanks for sharing that. And has appropriately set the tone for the upcoming cast. And you know, so you got the info. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass the ball to you. Set a set a good booby trap for the listener so that they are gonna <laughs> fall into our podcast. <laughs> Got it. We're going. We're rolling. We're action. Okay. So tonight we have speeches that got someone killed, and then uh, Mike and Ross and Matt and Landon are going to uh, pleasure you all with with their thoughts about. The Great Speech by George W. Bush. That's it. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thanks, Dan. And as we like to say here at the Speech Guys, now you you say cue the music, Dan. <laughs> oh, cue the music. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Okay. Thanks very much. Michael Schaefer, Ross Johnson, Matt Schultz, and Landon Fry are all are all here. Yeah, free, free. I've been back and I'm just gonna say it. I've been thinking it for ten minutes. I don't want to podcast here. Oh yeah. Now I'm 
I've seen the road. Pregnancy is a beautiful thing. Pregnancy is a gift. Shit. Oh, there are stories to tell. Enough. What kind of paint sticks to asteroids? Like, if you don't climb your walls. lead us to a better place. We are called to emerge from that default setting of self involvement. Trying this again. Yeah. <laughs> I'm one second behind. I clicked it a little early, so Mike, uh, back you, my you frame guys up. are always one, behind. One, two, three, and you're good. There's always some yeah. tweaking. <clears throat> okay, on the other side of that cold open from my older brother, Dan. Dan, thank you for setting this up. <clears throat> As he said, George W. Bush is the speech in the speeches that got someone killed. His speech he gave on September 11th, 2001, in that evening, the first major address to a nation that needed unity, vision, justice. What else? Well, you'll find what else with the speech guys here tonight. Let's take a listen to that speech and go from there. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world, and no one will keep that light from shining. Today, our nation saw evil the very worst of human nature. And we responded with the best of America, with the daring of our rescue workers, with the caring of, for strangers and neighbors who came to give blood and help in any way they could. Immediately following the first attack, I implemented our government's emergency response plans. Our military is powerful and it's prepared. Our emergency teams are working in New York City and Washington, D.C to help with local rescue efforts. Our first priority is to get help to those who have been injured and to take every precaution to protect our citizens at home and around the world from further attacks. The functions of our government continue without interruption. Federal agencies in Washington, which had to be evacuated today, are reopening for essential personnel tonight and will be open for business tomorrow. Our financial institutions remain strong, and the American economy will be open for business as well. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I have directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. I appreciate so very much the members of Congress who have joined me in strongly condemning these attacks. And on behalf of the American people, I thank the many world leaders who have called to offer their condolences and assistance. America and our friends and allies join with all those who want peace and security in the world. And we stand together to win the war against terrorism. Tonight, I ask for your prayers for all those who grieve. 
for the children whose worlds have been shattered, for all whose sense of safety and security has been threatened. And I pray they will be comforted by a power greater than any of us, spoken through the ages in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. This is a day when all Americans from every walk of life unite in our resolve for justice and peace. America has stood down any enemies before, and we will do so this time. None of us will ever forget this day, yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. Thank you. Good night, and God bless America. Uh, actually, a recorded speech, uh, not done live for security reasons. Ooh, hot take. Really? I did not know that. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. How about that? Definitely felt live when I tuned in as a sixth grader. And uh, yeah, I definitely remember watching it in its entirety 23 years ago. Yeah, no, me too, for sure. Hmm. He scrambled. He was uh, he was in Florida, and then I think the Jets just did random loops around the U.S. Then he landed in, like, Nebraska and Omaha, which is where, like, the the bunker is in the mountains. And then there, he demanded Landon, to... There are to... no mountains in Nebraska. <laughs> Well, okay, fair. Um, I was gonna say, what? I, I don't have the I don't have the article up. John um, Denver is full of shit. There's no mountains here. I think they scrambled. They landed at a base in Nebraska or Iowa to refuel, and the decision was like, you know, go hunker down. And he demanded to get back to the White House to make a speech same day, get it on record. For first reactions, mm -hmm. Landon, you sort of went organically into that. What what else? I did. Um, I'll throw out. You know, I did see when I skimmed through all of our our notes here a, a really robust document of, of thoughts and ideas that, unfortunately, our viewers are not privileged to. Um, I saw like some topics of like discussing just war, and then I went back and read the speech watch the speech um having just done five minutes of just war definitions and theories and the one line that kind of really stuck out to me also with 20 year 20 plus years of what happened after the speech again our title here is speeches that got someone killed so you know this speech and the people who were killed um is a we can discuss, but he says, we will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. People, tribes, countries up, up for um, discussion here. That's a, it's a big claim, perhaps. Is, is that a, a just war response? Um... Uh, I mean, my first reaction to the speech itself, um, well, I guess my first first reaction, because I do remember the speech as a kid, uh, I would say maybe similar to, to Dan, just, uh, I mean, obviously I was very young. This is like, I mean, I'm in, I think we're all in sixth grade. Mike, you might have been seventh grade, I think, right? Something I like was, that. I was, okay. yeah. I but, uh, yeah, so like emerging adolescent, right, young adolescent, um, I think there was, uh, uh, yeah, a for sure sense of pride, a sense of like uh, uh, in our nation and whatnot just uh, from this speech and um, things that you saw in the history book or you read in history books and like stories and, and heroes and things. And I'm like, okay, this is like a situation where, like so, heroes will emerge in some way, shape, or form, 
you know, uh, not necessarily like George Bush per se, like the, the speech giver, but just, uh, yeah, I just thought that was kind of a, a cool, heroic uh, sounding speech. Um, I would say, I mean, similar reaction to the, you know, reading it or uh, hearing it again as an adult. Um, I, yeah, I guess I can't help but think um, just of how unified we were in the wake of this. Uh, and how, yeah, I, I just, how muffled the response maybe would have been today and just, yeah, so some of the, yeah, just the changes that have been, have occurred on that front. So I guess that's maybe my first thought or reaction to hearing it right. as an adult. Yeah. This did, yeah, 95% of America was completely just on the same page. The reason that I chose this speech, I wish I could say there's something super profound, but there's not necessarily. It just felt a natural, a natural um, idea to that was sort of different from Ross's, obviously, uh, speeches that got someone killed. So you know who's who's getting killed in this speech? Well, Osama bin Laden was obviously killed because of everything that transpired in the years afterwards. Um, you know, some number of let me see. So I jotted down the numbers. Uh, about 2,500 Americans were killed in the Afghanistan war. Uh, 2,000 civilian contractors, which I thought that was crazy. That's almost one for one. Um, that was over 20 yeah. years. Some uncertain number of veteran suicides uh, from that war due to PTSD. Um, the the, 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 the um, obviously the several thousand people who were killed uh, at the Twin Towers, the Pentagon, on the planes. Um, on that day um, so you're looking among all of those uh, about 180,000 people among Americans and non-Americans killed um, around this event I guess technically the speech didn't kill and quote unquote kill anyone on 9-11 everyone after that uh, in a sense <laughs> but right. um, I've got I had another, I had a higher number, the, um, shoot, I've got the number at a million according to, uh, Carnegie. A million. Okay, how did you get a million? Uh, Carnegie Institute, it's, it's, uh, civilians and combatants. So there's the Afghanistan quarter million, Iraq quarter million. And it is like all after effects of, of nine 11. So Iraq yeah, sure. plus Afghanistan plus like Syria, Syria was destabilized half million. And then it stops at that, which is right at almost a million people. But there are like, I mean, Libya and several other middle east yep. countries were destabilized because of this so like it's at least a million you could even say up to five million so i wait well i mean now wish is a strange word you know it's it's almost 23 years since the event it's june there is no significant anniversary on which we're discussing this topic but you know as I said, Dan was a freshman in college. I was in seventh grade. And when I was in seventh grade, the rest of you guys were sixth. And, you know, there is, after prepping for this over the past couple of days, I sort of describe an experience similar to when I was prepping for the, a speech from the beginning of the year, President Reagan, the Challenger disaster. And... I think, I think when you're in seventh grade, it's like the rest of the world is just very, it's very sterile. It's very cartoonish in a sense, but, but it still occupies a certain place in your mind. It's like, oh yeah, I know, I, I know that 9-11 happened, 
But then, so it takes up a certain place. But then you revisit, you know, I was listening to this audio of different passengers and some from the terrorists themselves. And I found myself, my eyes, my eyes getting teary again, imagining these passengers on the airplane in the final seconds before it hit this building. And there's, it's just, there's something profoundly um, vivid about thinking about them again this way. And so choosing the speech just sort of gives an opportunity to revisit this experience in a more material um, and adult way. Um, so that's why I chose speech. Um, anything particular about the speech that strikes me? I mean, we we're, of course, a George Bush family. We we're on Team Bush. So, you know, this was, we we're, we we're in his corner for this. And it does mark the beginning of this, of this era of unity. Both meaningful unity in terms of the votes that were cast to go to war, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, but also the country songs, the old Navy American flag t-shirts, not a single corner of unity was ignored there. And I remember feeling like there was something cheap to that or fake. What do you guys remember about the brand of unity then or what you might have thought about it? I certainly wasn't thinking that deeply on it about like cheap or fake. I would say like, I think the first, um, the first time where I was, I, I maybe felt that way was, I th- and I don't know how, I can't remember the timeline, but the, mm, the Toby Keith yeah. put a boot in their ass. It's the American way song. I think was the first time I felt like, and there's some part of the, just like an immature high school or I don't know, middle school, whatever, however old I was when that song came out, that was like, uh, thought that might've been kind of cool, but like, I would definitely felt like yeah, some disconnect there. Um, I remember, uh, yeah, just, uh, there's a family member who I remember like playing that song on a, on a trip. We were going, uh, this is like a cousin of mine, uh, and he seemed to like be really into it. And I was like, Oh yeah, I like my cousin. Like he's great. And he's a great guy. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was just, I've always had a little bit of disconnect there with that. Yeah. That specific thing, but oh uh, yeah, I don't remember it being cheap much. You know, I, I think I, I don't know. I guess I, I thought it was fairly sincere. Almost. Yeah, I did too. I didn't feel at all unsincere or um not genuine uh i think it it started to like late by 2010 maybe and then like things like american sniper came out where the first 10 minutes of the movie was like their response to seeing the news and then like Chris Kyle and Rolls and like he's the sheepdog. He's gonna like protect the country and there's kind of a sure. um just to try to try to I don't know if it was like remembering or like putting yourself in the context ten years prior to what those those people who did see this and like enroll immediately and like were all the people on the ground in Afghanistan and Iraq the last. 20 years um but yeah it it i didn't it didn't there was no irony or um disconnection for it for me at the time mike were you just a, a hipster that was upset <laughs> yeah. that you 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 just you were you were on team bush when it was just a 50 yeah. percent approval rating and then it jumped <laughs> to 90 overnight and uh yeah you weren't right. cool anymore um I do remember, similar than I do remember the gas being $5 a gallon for a day or maybe a couple of days, and us going to, my mom took me to DQ for some reason that day. I remember exactly where we sat 
kind of down on the main floor in one of the two-person booths. And I asked her if Dan and Dad might get drafted, and my dad was obviously too old to be drafted at that point, but she said, maybe Dan. And um, I remember kids at school the next day, Amy, I remember Amy asked uh, if there was going to be, like, doesn't the Bible, is there going to be a World War Three? and doesn't the Bible say the world ends at World War Three? and so he had all of those <laughs> things going. I do also remember a sense of dread. What are you, an evangelical or something? <laughs> <laughs> um, a sense of dread. Like, do you guys get set? It's so rare one gets a sense of dread. Like, do you guys get that ever? I don't know. Like, like, like in a. Like, yeah, you, I guess I don't you know. know it when you have <laughs> I it. I don't know it. I don't know. <laughs> Pollyanna here <laughs> dancing around in his skirt. <laughs> Everything's fine. Um, I've had <laughs> it two well. times uh for sure in my life. Um once was this September 11th and the other was it wasn't long. It, it was very brief. It was maybe like for a couple days or something. But um, right before, right at the time of lockdown with COVID. Because I think it's a combination of something bad and uncertainty and not knowing how it's going to play out. Well, I think I always had like a sense of, uh, or at least like, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's some immaturity here, um, especially with 9-11, but a sense of like this... Uh, maybe more so than dread is to like, like, Oh, like there's a serious, cause I think I, at that, I mean, I was 11 years old. So like way away from any sort of military age, I think at that point in time, I was like, I had as sincere as a conviction as a 11 year old can have or 12, whatever, uh, I guess almost 12, um, that like military would have been a good thing. And like, I was, yeah, I guess I was thinking about it more, um, for maybe like six months or so. Uh, in the aftermath of that. Uh, and I would say, yeah, I was like, oh, like military, like I should do, like, I don't know, you hear stories about people doing it and I th- admired those stories. I thought they sounded really heroic and like they are. Um, so like, yeah, I mean, as an 11 year old, I was, I mean, again, it, that that didn't last, you know, it wasn't a serious enough thing to, and, you know, certainly, I mean, within I don't know, three years after 9-11, like the tables totally turned on our patriotism in that scenario, you know, um, at least in public opinion. Maybe that's too soon. I don't know exactly the timetable on that. But uh, and I think that that very quickly waned in me. But I think I almost had a similar idea in in the beginning of COVID um, that I would like have to do these like 16 hour shifts, like working at a hospital and like triaging people outside because there wasn't room. And, you know, in, in part because of, I think ex- just uh, media exaggerations and, and projections and things uh, when we didn't know much. Um, and then what it actually ended up looking like was like these really short shifts in the hospital because we had too many people who weren't doing their normal job. So we had too many workers. So they're just finding <laughs> random crap to do. <laughs> and I was wiping butts. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and like that, that was, you know, which, uh, yeah, I, I think maybe that's just kind of like the maturity thing. Like heroism sometimes does look like wiping butts and, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's just different. Landon, you, I kind of have the, go ahead, Mike, go ahead, Mike. Well, yeah. I'm, you, you link the Straussian moment here. We need to get our legs under us. We need to start ah, chewing on something. The Straussian yeah. moment. Peter Thiel. Can you sort of introduce that yep. article and why you found it interesting? Absolutely. Yeah. I uh, was going to quickly say I did have the opposite, Matt. I, I grew up in like a farm town and hmm. it really never crossed my mind to like join in. I always just, for some reason, I think I studied like atomic bombs like in fifth grade for some half page paper 
I was like, yeah, even if they dropped an atomic bomb. You studied bombs? Uh, if they dropped a bomb on Chicago, like, it still wouldn't affect us. And, and I just, like, the the coast and, like, news and, like, I was like, that's for, like, those people. Like, nobody cares. Nothing's ever, there's those no, there's slickers. nothing that will affect us, like, out here in farm country. Like, we tune into the Today Show for a half an hour every morning just to see, like, a glimpse of the outside world but like nothing it, it didn't ever really trickle down um hmm. and so oh like this place way far away in new york city was hit fascinating what what how do they feel i wonder um and i yeah it just never crossed my mind that it really impacted me and like i don't know um, I mean, yeah, high gas prices, etc. Uh, it it was life changing to a degree, but it just seemed like it wasn't the civilization I was living in. Um, part one, part two, yeah, I think that this moment, uh, a really good paper that I come to come back to a lot. It's called the Straussian moment. Um, Right, yeah, moment, yeah. Uh, Peter Peter Thiel wrote yeah, it. Peter Thiel, primary investor in yeah. Facebook. Um, how many page? Twenty fifteen page PDF. Basically, it it, it reads kind of like his a graduate level paper on four hundred years of Western philosophy and how to understand the way that Western Westernism, Western psychology, Western capitalism. And it's kind of hitting a wall moment with the reality that there still are perhaps two thirds of the world that just don't subscribe to what has happened in Europe and North America um, since the Renaissance. Um, and, I, and it even and Peter Thiel is is so a what? Why don't you put a fine point on that? What has happened? Would you say since the Renaissance in the West that has not happened? We yeah, God is dead. We don't need God. Science solves everything, and everybody agrees on this worldview. And of course, we all want peace. And um, that that and of course, like the devil and God. That's all kind of spiritual that's not a primary consideration to how we organize our societies and our laws and our governments um now the, of course you know um this wasn't that as true in 1776 we said you know our rights are from god but as we've gone through the centuries especially up until the 20th like that has eventually eroded and then with with the attack by Islamic fundamentalists on the heart of our economy and its representation in the Twin Towers, we are not, our enemy is not somebody wanting to make more money than us or to defeat us. It is like, it is perhaps a group of tribal people who think that we are evil or we are not of their religion and and that is just, that is the type of war that was fought in the 1400s, not in the 21st century. And Peter's thesis is that basically, you know, pre-Western ideology actually still exists in the world and maybe in a very large portion and maybe even it's growing and, and he, he he is a Christian. He brings in some of his medic theory and scapegoating that we've talked about in prior podcasts on Rene Girard. Um, and that like, as if you are, he basically kind of says like, if you are a Christian and you are an American, like you need to weave all these things together. You need to consider them for how to view the world. And the last, I'll just, <clears throat> let me, um, the last paragraph is really good. The Christian statesman 
must diverge in the t series of Strauss. Uh, that's not that interesting. Um, and in determining the correct mixture of violence and peace, the Christian statesman would be wise in every close case to side with peace. There's no formula for this. We don't know what a close case means, but it must go with peace in every specific interest. Um, he goes on to say, for the world could be different from this modern world. It could be much, much worse than it is today, or it could be much better. The limitless violence, i.e. probably the atomic bomb, of runaway mimesis, of runaway competition with China or Russia or um, etc., or the peace of the kingdom of God will prevail. So like he's really, he pulls in revelation type themes to his political, cultural, religious worldview that actually, yeah, even though it's 2024, um, there's a, a spiritual underline here that, that goes much beyond simple trade agreements and making sure that everyone um, feels comforted in their economics. So that that is a, kind of a, his seminal piece coming. Basically his description of 9-11 is, is called the Straussian moment. Go read it and it, it's interesting. So reading that reminded me of um, at least one, and I've heard, I think, I, yeah, I think Ben Shapiro has uh, has rightly riffed riffed on this. Um, but NPR, you know, there's a lot of um, attribution of terrorist activity in the Middle East due to the effects of climate change. Something to the effect of like, well, look, see, things are getting hotter and that's why they're doing this. It's not enough, you know, something like that, which maybe there's like 0.3% of truth to that. And rather than dealing with the content of the belief system that opposes, you know, like the article seems to be saying, the the West itself. Um, yeah, that, that stuck out to me. Um, another, I don't know, you might, you might sort of find this interesting. Um, Landon, what did you say? So I, in the Straussian moment, you mentioned that like kind of the, the summary of kind of like modern Western civilization where you said like science solves everything and like a couple other points. Could you just repeat those? I thought. Yeah. Yeah. He, in the meat of this paper, Peter breaks down, you know, if you take the great philosophers of the last one or 200 years and extrapolate the direction that each of them thought the West was on, he kind of, mm -hmm. he essentially breaks down each of their arguments to like, you're wrong because of this, you're wrong because of that. Like all of them were sec, most of them mm -hmm. were secular and he, he does critique their secularness with a Christian spiritual lens. And what he kind of, the fine point is like, if all of you are right, like 9-11 wouldn't have happened. Mm. Or sure. the response, maybe the response to 9-11 wouldn't have happened. Like the, the fact that 9-11 happened like breaks the <clears throat> logic breaks in the your theory. arguments. And therefore this is a a resetting um and, and also i think there is just a, a pretty large i'm just going back to just fundamentalism gerard teaching like the a-bomb is just always a, a much bigger deal than than we even think about in our mm -hmm. everyday lives like now now so many countries do have the ability to just completely obliterate each other perhaps the world mm -hmm. and that's that's a different power dynamic well that's a power dynamic that yeah directly leads to like the end times or we can keep maintaining the peace and what what does that mean 
I'm just thinking about like in a world where science solves everything, like kind of preserving the Kush economy um, are kind of like your guiding principles. I would almost see it as like that type of environment makes it seem it, like it's impossible to have a just war. If those are your guardrails for life, I don't know. Maybe that's not a... Um, I sort of see what you're getting at, but but spell it out a little bit more. Um, I guess in lieu of in lieu of what what Landon describes as like the the middle age sort of mentality, in lieu of like having actual values that mean something and that are worth dying for, if in place of that you have uh, this desire for like, eh, let's just all get along and you know have a nice economy and um, you know, science will solve our problems eventually if we just, you know, trust the science and, you know, hand over power to whoever, you know, will solve the problems. Like, you know, yeah, things will be fine, right? Um, if if that's your perspective and, uh, yeah, and like maybe that, that's just uh, too cartoonish of a representation to like actually have a serious thought on it. But, uh, yeah, it would seem impossible that there would ever be a circumstance that would like count as a just war simply because you're there's nothing worth dying for you know like or there i don't know maybe the kush economy is worth dying i don't know i guess it just seems uh seems like you're doomed to this kind of uh ebb and flow in this weird dance that we've gone through like uh you know hyper security with like some of the nsa stuff that that uh, that happened in the wake of 9-11 and then you go from that to like complete pacifism like we deserve 9-11 because we're not you know we've contributed to climate change and made lives terrible for the middle easterners you know um yeah it just seems like th there's no there's no room for any just war there um like you can't even broach the conversation because of these ships that never intersect with each I mean, other i kind of <clears throat> i wouldn't we could list out the points of just war i wrote them yeah yeah there. we're going um, that way go go ahead list them out i think just war uh contemporary catholic doctrine version there might be others there probably are a the damage inflicted by the aggressor so by islamic terrorists on the u.s um must be lasting grave and certain and then all other meetings of putting an end to, uh, yeah, I'll use 9-11 for an example to make it really clear. All other means of putting an end to Islamic terrorism must have been shown to be impractical or ineffective. There must be serious prospects of succeeding in um, eliminating Islamic terrorism and the use of arms, the use of retaliation to Islamic terrorism must not produce evils or disorders graver than the evil to be eliminated. Yeah, let's go through them, shall we? Um, honestly, the second three seem very relevant to September 11th. The first one, not so much. What do you guys think? The damage inflicted by the aggressor on the nation must be lasting, grave, and certain. Does it need to have all three of those things? I don't feel like it's well. I mean, yeah, lasting. It was a it was a one hit wonder. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It it was grave. It was right. certain. Yep. But it definitely mm -hmm. was not last. Well, in hindsight, it in hindsight it wasn't lasting. It was certainly unknown at the time of especially at the speech yeah yeah and i think that's um that's just one dynamic that in the times where just war theory or, uh, yeah in the time that just war theory has been like explicated um terrorism was not a th i mean i suppose there are acts of terror you know one random tribe invading another tribe whatever but um yeah it's also like this was developed in a time where there were nation states yeah. and they all kind of did this sort of thing, you know? And, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about, like, I don't like, and I don't know that it needs to be revised. That's not what I'm saying, 
Um, but it is just such a unique, uh, yeah, it's a unique thing to try to fit into this um, because of that reason. Like, I'm sure there are still Islamic terrorists who would love to attack the United States. I think that's a safe assumption. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's not the same ones, maybe, right? They're different countries and, you know, slightly different motives. And I don't know. Mike, what did you, how did you distinguish point one from point two through four? What exactly were you saying about point two through four? Uh, I was just saying that they all, they all seemed um, on par with the Afghanistan war. I mean, I suppose maybe um, the last one might require more intensive research. The use of arms must not produce evils and disorders graver than the evil to be eliminated. Um, I mean, how many new terrorists did activity in Afghanistan and Iraq create? I don't know. Yeah. I, okay. I, I definitely probably question, um, two through four more than point one. Like, I mean, we turned around and pretty much went straight to Afghanistan. I don't know if we really tried anything else to know that it was impractical, impractical or ineffective. Yeah, but, you know, it obviously goes with Matt, with what Matt was just saying. It's like, what, you know, if, if Putin attacked us, like, we would know exactly how to go about being diplomatic right. with him yeah you know yeah. uh versus yeah. yeah bin laden i mean they're probably at the time it was like oh we need to go find a rogue tribe in afghanistan like we're the u.s of course we're gonna succeed at this and then in hindsight 22 years later we you know we replaced the taliban with the taliban Maybe there weren't serious prospects of success. But at the same time, it's like, did I feel like we may have discussed this on another podcast. It feels like we avoid, like, another September 11th could have easily happened. Potentially, yeah. Yeah, and that's such a big unknown. I don't know. Like, who the hell knows, who the hell knows how lasting this is? Um, it's, it's just such a novel, uh, means of warfare, uh, that the world isn't like, still hasn't really adjusted to yet. I don't think. Maybe it's a final bell and you can just be like, beep, table it for later. But like, we just read through this, we read the speech. We're back on September 11th. We're listening to this George Bush. We have the complete knowledge of what transpired two decades later would we go to war and go hunt him down or not like was was all of this worth it we can save it for later too if that's to answer landon's question i i don't like i mean, i don't remember exactly how you worded it would we go hunt him down i i i heard that as if i was a you know 18 year old man like would I have joined the armed forces and and whatnot and I don't think that I would have it it seemed I don't think I would have felt so in danger that it would have required my like um like when I think of war and just war and all those things like I and I know this isn't the technical definition by any means but like I think of it in terms of like a self-defense type thing and it felt it feels more like we got hit, but there was other ways to prevent us being hit again. Are all means exhausted? Like you get, we meant like I don't know if that I don't know if that has to be like diplomatic, like we shake hands, or like are there other ways we can prevent nine eleven from happening without going to war? Yeah, I, I would add like we spent we spent eight we've spent eight trillion specifically. On 9-11 follow-up wars, $30,000 per man, woman, and child, every American. I don't know much about, like, 9-11 victims and the firemen and policemen, but, like, 
I feel like I've heard some horror stories of like how hard it is for them to get like some pretty basic treatment on some of the stuff they've had. Yeah. I think you re rewind the clock, you can spend eight trillion on quite a few better things than where we ended up putting it. I do think it's, I mean, I think it's like a temptation, but I don't know, just thinking about just running with the just war thing a little bit because that's where it is right now. Like, I don't think you can use hindsight, though. There's no way of knowing that in the moment. It's like you just have to use the information that you have to the best of your ability. And I'm not saying that was or wasn't done, but I just think it's dangerous to use any sort of hindsight because then we're going to say, oh, they made the wrong decision or the right decision, but, like, they didn't have that information at the <clears throat> time. So I don't know if you can... You Correct. don't know if you can... Yeah judge the decision with information that just wasn't accessible it is not the best use of mental or emotional energy for hindsight but like really being critical of the prior two decades of war we're basically in another two wars now with israel and gaza and ukraine and russia and like I think the use of hindsight is to like apply it to what's next. Some ongoing chess war that is either back to the Straussian moment, like we should pretty much always lean towards the side of peace in every close case. Because the rest is just flirting with nuclear annihilation. Even just a little bit of the history of Osama bin Laden pre 9-11. I mean, the CIA supported the group that he was a part of. Oh, are we at know, the conspiracy uh, part now? Conflict with <laughs> No, no, no. I'm I'm just saying <laughs> good luck. Just as like uh, yeah, maybe this is just a telling, a cautionary tale, maybe. US worried about Russia. Seems fair. Russia was big and scary back in the 70s. Um throw a bunch of money at um Afghan militant groups uh to fight the soviets great that worked out but now those so those groups don't like us and then they attack us and now we spend more money trying to like suppress those groups for the next 20 almost 20 years and then we pull out because we decide i don't know what was part of that decision but rather abruptly it would seem that like all right that's not worth it anymore literally back to square one Right, like Taliban still in control of Afghanistan. Last I had checked, maybe that's changed. I don't know. It seems like no one in the Middle East likes us a ton, right? Like, I guess Teddy Roosevelt once said, "Like walk softly and carry a big stick." Just, I don't know. Just do your thing and be ready if something comes to. I know, uh, like something did come to our soil. So, like that does make this particular thing maybe a little trickier. But correct. Um, yeah. Fair. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's. It, well, and I was going to say just the other thing with there is so much, I mean, especially with military operations, there's so many levels of clearance, uh, security clearance and whatnot that like the four of us have like maybe 2% of the information, like, and this is after us looking things up, you know what I mean? Like the average person has a fraction of 2%, you know, and it's yeah maybe i'm just a little bit nihilistic when it comes to foreign policy and especially because of like some of the straussian moment stuff you mentioned landon we're like and totally and different physical part of therapy. the world and physical therapy <laughs> that's we don't want to go down that road tonight <laughs> but uh yeah it, it just seems like it's impossible it's an impossible calculus this is like 5d chess and we don't know what the fifth yeah. dimension is yet um so, okay, just, so that's an interesting thought that maybe yeah. we can play with. And so what what are then the lessons, what are some of the lessons for the, for your typical American family post 9-11? You know, what's, what's Dan telling his kids about what he experienced that day and take away? Mm, yeah. You know, and, and I'm thinking in terms of, yeah, the small things that you do. Like, it is interesting how, what were the small things people might have done differently or more after the event. 
Um, how did we think of our president differently for better or for worse or vice president? So one thing small that does immediately stick out to me, um, I rem- I'm, I'm sure you guys, rem- but I remember in high school, do you guys remember the t-shirts, uh, that said, not my president, that had George Bush's face on it? You don't remember those? Um, maybe in like I, I would, I believe maybe a little. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You guys just all red, white, and blue at your school. We had yeah, um, yeah, but like you know, goths and hipsters wear them. But anyway, I felt like that was the first time I saw something like that. And not saying that is the first time something like that existed. Maybe part of it was my age. It, it doesn't seem like that kind of disrespect towards your leader especially when it's not paired with something else like worthwhile because it's like this the kid i can picture a kid wearing it his name's nick like you were like you're not doing anything else to improve on our situation you're just crapping on someone's decision that as matt said we know less than two percent of the knowledge that he does in making these decisions and it's like what what does that gain and then you can imagine the things with social media they're all sort of like little brothers of that behavior of crapping on this or that thing not providing any meaningful solution yeah i like that and i i think um especially i i didn't watch the whole thing but the uh i watched maybe a 10 minute chunk of Mm, the uh, documentary that you posted mike on the outline. Um, and I think one of the, yeah, I think one of the things I like about our podcast is bringing mm-hmm. things down home. Yep. You know, there are lots of big ideas percolating, but you know, when it comes to, you know, meeting someone on the sidewalk, you know, or whatever, just, uh, dealing with your neighbors, like what, how does that pertain? And, um, uh, yeah, I guess I'm just reminded of some of the, uh, it's like as terrifying of a situation as that must have been for someone trying to leave these towers before they collapse. This lady almost had a fondness of like her. So she right, like shared her yeah. inhaler with someone who had asthma, right? Like normally you don't share inhalers. Like, you know, I'm sure joint commission would have a field day on that one, but it's like, uh, wow. Like she, and then this girl I like, could breathe and she can get down and, uh, I don't know. Presumably she, I don't know if this lady made it, maybe this other girl made it too, hopefully. And just these like little things like that saved this woman's life, right? Just sharing an inhaler with her. Um, and there's, there's almost this fondness for that, right? It's like the, the poem in the, uh, that's quoted in the mm, beginning of a hidden yeah. life. I know we've referenced that movie a lot. I feel like we should have a speech guys movie. Yeah, list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll publish that for the platinum members or something, but uh, that would certainly be on there, but the, you know, it's the, the, something to the effect of the, that the world isn't half as bad as it could be is largely due right. to people in yeah. unmarked graves and, and whatnot, you know, because there is a lot more to nine 11 than the geopolitical fallout. You know, there is a lot more to nine 11 than, you know, conspiracy theories and, um, you know, political melodrama, um, yeah, like I think our, our country did come together in an authentic in an authentic way, um, and in authentic ways in like the Toby Keith Old Navy <laughs> sorts of ways. But like, um, but yeah, and, and at the end of the day, like that is something meaningful nonetheless, and certainly meaningful to the woman who whose life was saved by an inhaler, or the the EMT who has this like, I imagine like. He'll never deal with anything quite as crazy as that, you know? So, like, now he's this, you know, kind of unshakable veteran, you know, in in his field. Maybe in the words of George Bush, you can't dent the steel of American resolve. Yeah, if you're a virtuous person, you know, and you take that stuff and and, uh, and pivot it into as good of a thing as you can. The steel of American resolve. It's a... Play on industry and hearts, all in one. Uh, 
Mike, kind of the whole like, what do you take from it? Um, what do you, you know, how do we, what did it make you feel about like the president? How do you talk to your kids about it? I don't remember exactly what you said, but um, I have found like, and actually not before this speech, but like 9 11 in particular has been a way that talking about it to the kids a little bit, because my two oldest are old enough now to know like, on 9-11, it gets talked about at school and whatnot. It's like they're aware of what it was. Um, you can't sugarcoat like, or pivot or divert from what happened. So, like, I feel like... And my kids are still relatively little. So, it's right. So, my oldest is almost eight, six, four, and one. But I feel like other, you know, quote-unquote bad things, you can just distract them from. You know, well, what's, you know, what's a bad guy? Well, you know, dad will protect you. You know, we're fine. You know, like, there's just like, there's ways to make it seem like it's not going to happen, you know, or even like, even death is like, well, like, you know, they haven't had any like peers pass away, you know, cause they're little. So it's like, you know, who, who is really old, you know, way older than anybody, you know, so like, it's almost like make it seem like it's not a real thing. And I found like when they talked about 9-11 in school, that was maybe the first time, at least in our, I, uh, I think that's the first time that comes to my mind of like, there was just no way to talk around it. It was just like, yeah, like some people did a really bad thing. People died. Um, and yeah, I mean, they don't know, obviously, a lot of details and terrorists and like what all that stuff means. But um, I don't know, like as far as talking to the kids, and I feel like it was almost like a, I don't want to say good way, but they took it maybe bet like. I don't know, I think sometimes kids can handle more stuff than at least I had given them credit for. But that was the, at least in talking to the kids, that was one of the first times we had talked to them about something that there was no no way to put a cherry on top. It was just, this was bad. I also heard something interesting. I was listening to a podcast today about D-Day. Um, I don't know if you guys listened to the Art of Alien-S podcast on D-Day a couple weeks ago. Um a guy has written a book that's pretty much a compilation of first person accounts because there's very few people left um, that were there on D Day. And he uses 9 11 as an example or like a comparison because he said the reason he wanted to write the book on D Day was because, like, we are literally almost, there are almost no people left that, you know, were there. So in his mind, it was kind of like the last one of the last opportunities to gather, you know, first person accounts. And so anyway, but he talked about, so I don't remember how he said it's, it's, what does he say? Memory is passing into history or something like that was, I forget the exact quote, but he kind of talked about 9-11 similarly in for the first time we have people in the military. We have people that are, you know, joining the fire department and police departments of New York city that they literally weren't even born on 9-11. So, like, for them, it's not a memory. There's no, like, uh, it's completely, like, in, in the past, in history. And I don't know, I just kind of thought that was interesting. Yeah, sure. What about the conspiracy theories? Okay, conspiracy. Yeah, I guess so. Conspiracies. So, 9-11. <laughs> you know, obviously one of these... E- you guys are enjoying your microchips. <laughs> <laughs> I am too. <laughs> yeah, I have Bluetooth everywhere I go now. I love my microchip. It's great. Um, yeah, so 9-11, obviously one of these things that attracts a lot of conspiracy theories like other significant world events, COVID and the shape of the world. <laughs> <laughs> create creation itself uh, <laughs> is it right is it responsible is it harmless is it okay to entertain conspiracy <laughs> theories around something like this where so much life was lost um and i'm gonna qualify that in a second there um you know, there there is something to be said for when we're talking about conspiracies, you know, in terms of like the shape of the earth. There there is something that at some level that's like harmless about it. It's like, okay, these people think the world is flat, whatever, you know. Whereas you're doing something like this, there's a certain 
you know, undoubtedly thousands of lives were lost on this particular day. And it seems like a certain amount of seriousness should be uh, rendered it, right? Um, at the same time, it's like, yeah, there is there is something to be said for considering other other possibilities of things. Just just to poke holes, so many lives were lost. The, another way you could say what you just said is like so many lives were lost how could you possibly question the primary narrative of which like so many lives were lost wouldn't you question everything like who who and why did this happen like that's that should be that should be the question like all day long. Why would you not investigate um, it if it's yeah? Versus like, here's what we heard almost the first day that it happened. Um. Well, just to briefly respond, I wouldn't say no. I I said treating it with a certain amount of seriousness. Um, Correct. Yeah. 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 I guess the thing with the 9-11 conspiracy theories that's interesting isn't so much the theories. I think it's just, I don't know, they just seem rather implausible. Uh, haven't done a deep dive, I'll admit, but just it seems like for every point, there's a very strong counterpoint um, in regard to like, oh, this, you know, there was a, it was a demolition because of thermite or some random weird thing. It It seems like there's rather, I don't know, credible people um yeah just doubting that uh poking holes and poking holes in the po the hole pokers you know um i think it's just an interesting group of people right I, I it seems like you have the people who just didn't like bush and are like oh it's the you know bush family just trying to get access to middle eastern oil or just to you know it's them trying to uh whatever pick fights in the middle east and then you'll have i think more conservative folks saying like oh this is the government trying to justify surveillance system on us you know and um just these different yeah just kind of an odd coalition of people who seem to be really into this uh these sorts of theories i guess that's yeah that's what kind of sticks out to me with i'll go ahead and offer up two to be blown up and these are the two that i've heard well, the first one I think I've heard reverberate through a lot of different places. The first one would be Building 7, which was like um, the third, the, yeah, three buildings collapsed that day. Building 7 crumbled to the ground at about 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Pretty tall, but I don't know how many stories it was, but free fell. And then the really... There's kind of like all of the things that are odd about it, like who was in there, the SEC, Secret Service, CIA. But the the catcher is like the BBC reported that it had collapsed while it was in the background of their reporting on it. And I don't think that it's been disproven that that was a fact. Happy to blow that out of the water. But three bill, yeah, pretty big building fell. It was not directly hit and it just collapsed out of nowhere. So that that's like an interesting one. And then the other one that really gets me, and I even did a little more research on it right before, well, for this episode. The day before, September 10th, Rumsfeld holds a press conference and admits the Department of Defense has lost and cannot account for 2.3 trillion dollars of spending <clears throat> i mean you can go to c-span and look this one up what in the Rumsfeld world holds a press conference uh we yeah 2.3 trillion dollars yeah we we it is unaccounted for don't ask us what in the so, world at that time the dod's annual expense oh was 300 billion. So Rumsfeld got up in front of C-SPAN and said, we don't know 
where the last eight years of every dollar the DOD has been allocated. Eight years of the entire budget of the DOD, we're not sure. And then on September 11th, the wing of the Pentagon is completely destroyed that would have any possible accounting of that. Those are the two that are just, just kind of like, what's going on here? To tie it back to the question, I feel like my first thought would be to place cons the 9-11 conspiracies more in the the first one you said, which is, you know, something the fact that it's, I don't know if disrespectful is the right word, um, but just, I think the weight of what happened demands a very, like, serious, solemn how you look at it. So, with any sort of, you know, I guess conspiracy, like the smell test or whatever, but, like, I feel like the heavier the weight of the event, the more you need to consider a conspiracy theory for it. Because I feel like what I was thinking was, like, well, why do people think this? Did they actually get presented with some evidence that was so so compelling that they were like forced to look into it or is it more like conspiracies are kind of fun and yeah sure I'll kind of hype on that trying a little bit and I feel like the I think it can go into more of a disrespect to jump on a you know oh a cool a kind of a a fun conspiracy so I feel like something as serious as 9-11 I think it would have to be a quality of evidence to believe a conspiracy, any, even consider a conspiracy or even like talk about it, I feel like would have to be very high. Or I do think you can kind of wade into the, you know, oh, this happened, or maybe it was this, but it's like, I think the one thing like we know happened was, you know, a lot of people died. Um, and I think you have to, to have that kind of uh, lens when you think about it. I mean, Matt, I think your example that you shared in the notes was, was sort of a useful example of the... Why don't you just tell the example? Yeah, so the, this was like... So sixth grade, um, this is maybe a week or two or so after September 11th, but I guess like this... It sounded like it was a school-wide thing that they're going to... The teachers were going to set aside time, you know, let's just say fifth period or whatever it was. And be like, all right, just we want to like at least give you guys a chance to talk about feelings or thoughts or whatever that you have about September 11th, more or less just to, yeah, I guess have an open environment on it, encourage kids to share whatever. I don't know if it was the first thing. Some details are fuzzy because it was a long time ago. But among the first few kids who raised their hands and said anything, I think he asked the teacher, like, is it true that like... Osama bin Laden, or you know, whatever he he, and he basically just listed out a conspiracy theory, just asking the teacher if this is true. I don't even remember it being like super scary or super whatever, but like whatever it was, the teacher thought it was just like out of line and just unnecessarily frightening. Said to the student something to the effect of, uh, "That's exactly the type of thing that like that's just meant to scare people." And he was sent to the principal's office. And like, I'm laughing not because I mean it's it's a serious thing, and as a teacher, I've got zero clue how I would handle that, you know. But yeah, there is a certain like funny irony, and like just be open and just you know ask questions, and like <laughs> question number two, don't ask the get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's just kind of this like, yeah, it's this touchy dynamic of of you know how much curiosity is appropriate versus not or how much what types of curiosity is appropriate versus not and i mean maybe some of the points i made earlier just like how little everyone knows i think is just way underestimated <laughs> in any foreign policy related discussion topic that yeah it, it's just yeah it, i think it's just an interesting example of how the world interacts with conspiracies and but and i think i wrote this in our notes isn't that why they executed Socrates? Did he not stir up the youth to question the sure the state? Well, yeah, I mean a broad way, yeah, but 
he wasn't positing conspiracy theories. He seemed much more reasonable He's than saying, like. Uh, but he didn't. Yeah, I, he I didn't. mean, and, and it depends on the. It depends on the way you. Correct. That was a, a framing that fit the answer. But how far of a stretch is it? I'm trying to rein myself. Well, in. I mean, I think that I think to answer it, you one needs to define what a conspiracy. And we were. I mean, we're starting to go back down holes we've been in before but it's like what is a conspiracy theory what it has to hinge at some level on um saying that this is the truth and the only reason it's not believed at a broader scale is because this other group doesn't want you to believe it and now that it can still sometimes be true, but even if it's true, like that's still gonna be the mechanism that's there. And all I'm saying is that I don't think that's where Socrates was coming from. Yeah, as far as like the student example, it's like who knows, you know, what exact it got, it could have been obvious that the student was asking it in a um, you know, way that he was just wanting to get attention. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And I, I don't recall the detail, you know, yeah, I don't recall the dynamics if that was a sincere question versus... Or, a, yeah. or if it was innocent, then, well, yeah, and it was, he was just uh, echoing, parodying something that his his dad had said at home or something. Well, the, yeah, then you certainly wouldn't send him to the office. But, yeah, there is something instructive in taking seriously your own questions that you ask i know the podcast that i've referenced michael Shermer, the uh the libertarian um neurologist and conspiracy theory expert as a sociological uh force you know he's referenced the um the child sex ring run by democrats in the basement of the pizza place out in washington dc the pizza gate thing you're familiar <laughs> pizza gate not the one matt did <laughs> sure <laughs> ruined gladiator <laughs> um and and there was the one guy one guy who went to this pizza restaurant thinking that there's a child sex ring in the basement and like they didn't even have a basement and the point that he was making is that to this guy's credit, he actually believed there was a sex ring, and then he went out and did something about it, right? Sure. Versus how many people would have said they believed that same thing, and, eh, no, didn't do anything about it. They would have claimed they believed 100%, but they didn't do anything about it. And just the point being is that, yeah, I mean, a conspiracy theory, well, sure, it's reasonable and entertaining, but you have to take seriously the question itself and if you're not willing to act on it then i don't think it's responsible to talk about really and i mean outside of a bonfire with with friends versus an online forum final bell ding 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 all your strength all your power all your love one more round there's no stopping this now this is our round now. We're starting, we don't stop. All your strength, all your power, all your love, everything you've got, this is your whole life. Do it now. Now. If you could, whew, I don't know, I'm just going to go with my knee jerk reaction. If you could pick any other president, living or dead, to take the place of George Bush, giving the speech, act. War on Terror, who who would it be and why? Mm. Oh, and well, okay, we'll make this a little more interesting too. They they could just be a political figure. So they've never been president. Maybe they ran for president. Oh. Okay. So if I say G dub, are you gonna think I mean George Bush? Or you can't think me and George Washington. <laughs> that is from his 2000 primary acceptance speech. 
That was how he got the largest applause when he accepted the Republican primary in 2000. I don't remember what state it was in, but he's up there and he's like alluding to why he should be the Republican nominee. And he's talking about George Washington and he turns to the audience and he goes, and his friends called him George W. And the crowd just erupted. And that is why he became president. Nice. Uh, I remember it distinctly. I watched it live. The I was like, what a 10 year old. Um, still just burned in my memory. While you guys are thinking, so I did for curiosity and research uh, search 9 11 conspiracy theories on Spotify to see what came up. And I saw one with Jimmy Aiken in it. And you guys know Jimmy Aiken, the Catholic ap- apologist. I, yeah. Pretty I know well the name. Known. I don't know apologist anything about for it. Catholic yeah. answers. Really big beard. He looks like a guy from Duck Dynasty. And like I've I've really grown to like respect him a lot. Like he is so charitable and humble and super duper knowledgeable. So I saw this, I was like, no, Jimmy, no, don't and so they start this podcast and there's like a subtitle to this podcast. So like, was it an inside job? It had like this weird font. And I was like, oh boy. So I started listening. And he just went sure. through every conspiracy theory and explained why they were not true. But he did it again in this very like humble way. He's like, well, anything's possible, but here's all the reasons that this doesn't seem to be the case. And la, la, la. Uh, but yeah, it was, yeah, it was really interesting. But Jimmy Aiken. Did he address the $8 trillion that was missing? No, he didn't do that one, but he did address the Israel and the mm. Mossad one. I'm interested enough in that one. I might Google it just to see where the eight trillion dollars went. Yeah, that seems like a pretty big accounting error. Yes. <laughs> so who would give it? I was I was literally thinking George Washington, as you made jokes about George Washington, <laughs> boss, but. Uh, I guess a speech of his that was part of the original Stillwater speech night uh, was his. um, uh, So his final speech as president, when he basically abdicated his role, right? So he was the only or first. uh, Yeah. He basically didn't run for, for a second term and yeah, just gave up the presidency after uh, yeah being our nation's first president. Uh, And I feel like, just that movement alone and uh uh yeah i know we have an entire episode on george i I don't know if it was that speech or not we have a george washington speech and uh no did that one not survive it's Um, gone and it was his first inaugural it was his first inaugural address but anyway um yeah i feel like he would be the type of character who I would trust with that. Quick answer. John McCain, you need someone who knows the cost of war. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What is the question again? One more time. Uh, if you could pick any other past president, living or dead, or political figure to give the speech and be our president 2000 2004, who is it? Uh, <clears throat> I'm always intrigued with Mr. Henry Wallace, <clears throat> um, VP of Roosevelt from 40 to 44, um, probably leaned more, way more towards the pacifist. His whole stance was let the Soviets do the Soviets thing. We'll do our thing. Who cares? Um, really focused on just the plight of middle, lower class. Would be curious how he would have perhaps better allocated $8 trillion to foreign wars. So I'll choose uh, Henry Wallace. Interesting. Former VP.
I'll be totally honest. Nothing really jumps to my mind. So I guess I'll just uh, pick a famous one. Um, I feel like it's almost a joke to say it, but like Abe Lincoln, I mean, he literally like saw us through a war, but he didn't seem to be like a war monger. So um, maybe he could play the, yeah, kind of the strength to do it, but don't really want to. And that might be a helpful attitude after something like this. You know, every episode can't be a grand slam, but if you're still listening, <laughs> thanks for thanks for hanging on here. <laughs> thanks for drinking. And thinking. And thinking. With us. Thanks for drinking. And thinking. With us. Hey, cue the music out there. Oh, who's on next? Matt? Matt. Dead ends come and go Look toward the horizon Up ahead you'll find A peace of mind Relief from the trying I had burned a bridge Wrecked in a ditch Had to ask forgiveness Dead ends come Look toward the horizon Oh, there are stories to tell The times we grew and the times we fell Oh, I've been afraid some days But the road will lead us to a better place The road will lead us to a better place